Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. We have a great guest today. As we know, we are a country that somewhat is somewhat at war all of the times, and we tend not to look behind the scenes. We tend not to look at the families that are affected by this reality. Today, we are honored to have Vicky Cody, who is the author of two two memoirs about an army about army wife and about fly safe or rather fly safe and army wife um vicky welcome to politics and right how are you doing today great thanks Eg- egberto for having me i i appreciate the opportunity well let me let me first tell you um any kind of story that i'm going to get about honoring those folks that I know are out there putting their lives on the line, I think deservedly so. So first of all, um, thank you for your, 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 both your, your husband and your two boys commitment to what they do to keep the country safe. Well, you are welcome. And thank you for, for mentioning that. Absolutely. So, but anyway, um, tell me a little bit about your story before we get, I don't want to talk about your guys right now. Tell me a little bit about who, uh, who you are. Who is Vicki Cody? Okay. Well, you know, I was an army wife for 33 years. And, and along that whole journey, I think I, I didn't realize I wanted to be a writer, but I was always observing and looking at things through the eyes of someone who I, I just know I was meant to put it into words at some point, but I didn't know. I was busy li- living life and it was a great life. Um, so my husband and I, we began this journey together in 1975 at the tail end of, of Vietnam, and we never dreamed where it was going to take us. But I have to think that it was all of, of the experiences, the ups and downs, um, the stress, the challenges, but the great joys and the pride of Army life that led me um, down this path of wanting to put it into words. Um, you know, along the way, we raised our two sons. They ended up wanting to follow in their dad's footsteps. And so it was it was actually the events of September 11th, 2001, that um, got me to the point where I thought, I've got to write about this way of life. Um, our sons started deploying right away. And I just thought that, um, you know, there wasn't enough out there about, like you said, behind the scenes, what it's like for the families. And so my first book actually was um, this little 64 page booklet that I wrote for the army. They handed it out for free and it's called Your Soldier, Your Army, A Family Guide. It's still available today, free of charge. But when I wrote that, I realized, wow, I've got a bigger story to tell. So it it led me to wanting to um, write a memoir. And then the the next memoir came and, you know, the rest is history. (laughs) Well, you know what I'm going to say here, because I noticed my question was, tell me about Vicky. I really didn't want to hear about the the boys and the guys. First, I wanted to know who you are. But within that, I actually gathered that you were somebody who wanted to tell a story that could help a lot of other people that are in that that are going through exactly what you go through as being the wife of a of, of an army of an aviator and the mother of two aviators. Wow, you got it on both ends. So uh, <laughs> exactly, yes, yeah. I feel so, that's my mission. Yes, yeah. yeah, so, so so that that's how I'm going to focus this interview, cen- cen- centralizing on what Vicky, Vicky feels, because we know those army guys, they're, they're going through what they're going through, but the families at home are usually the ones that are forgotten. Exactly, exactly. And you know, Egberto, what was interesting was when the war in Iraq began um, and our sons started deploying, and at that point, I had been doing this whole army wife thing for quite a few years, like probably 25 years at that point. I thought I had been there, done that, seen it all. But I have to say, when it is your son, your sons or daughters, your kids deploying, it is a whole different ball game. And there were so many times when the war first started. And at that point, my husband, you know, he was like big time general at the Pentagon. Tell us a little bit about that. Your husband actually was a four star general, right? Right. And and so, you know, I was with him from the time he was a second lieutenant all the way up to four star general and vice chief of staff of the army. And 
as as he was in that powerful position, that was when our sons were beginning their careers in the army. And we found ourselves in this position, um, you know, at night, I can remember being so worried when the war started and we had no word from our our oldest son who was already over there. The younger one was getting ready to join him. And I said to my husband, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter that you're a four star general. It doesn't matter that I've been doing this for 25 years with you. At the end of the day, we were two worried parents, so concerned about our our sons. And yeah, my husband had access to a lot of information that the average parent wouldn't have. But that's when I realized I need to help guide the parents out there, the ones just out there in middle America that have no affiliation to the army, their son or daughter stepped up, raised their right hand and said, you know, send me and off they go to war. What are those parents thinking? So that first book was designed just to get parents and family members through deployments, navigate army life. And then after that, my other two books or, you know, I wanted to entertain people as as well. So that's as Army TV. Wife. Yeah, Army Wife. That was the first memoir that encompassed um, our whole life as an Army couple. So that covered 33 years. That was a very daunting task, and it took me quite a few years to write. But again, I... I feel like by sharing all of my experiences, which in many ways are very typical, but in other ways, very unusual to have the husband and sons serving. Um, I felt like it was a way to shine the spotlight on all those men and women that wear the uniform and step up every day. We have young men and women, our sons and daughters that just say, you know, I want to do this. I want to be in our military. I want to serve our nation. And I feel like there's enough books out there written by the service members, and maybe they're writing about the combat and all of that kind of stuff. But there wasn't a lot out there written from the spouse or the mother's perspective, telling people what it's really like when you have loved ones serving. So that's always my goal, to get the message out there. And I think that is so important because, I mean, and, and you just said it there, uh, the point of view coming from the wife, the point of view coming from the mother, because so, so often, uh, I, I'll just put it bluntly, uh, the, the men get all the glory, glory, hallelujah, not realizing that that there, there's a support system that's underneath that. That general knew that when he was coming home, no matter what happened on, on, on the job, that he was coming home to a loving relationship. Those kids know that they had mama, that they could come and get that, 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 that rewarding warmth, <laughs> both in food and otherwise, you know, when they get home from flying that Apache in Iraq or wherever they're flying the Apache. And again, it's, it's usually the story that's left out. When we, when we give accolades to, to, to service people, we're giving it to, the guys well now women are flying and so forth now right, so exactly. they're, getting, they're getting a few now but i mean that's how it has been for quite a, a long time and to see that there is a there is an entire infrastructure behind those who fight you you totally get it, it exactly yes. it takes a family it right. literally takes a family to support a soldier. They can't do it on their own and whether it's their grandparents that raised them or, you know, a mom or a dad or whatever, those family members are so important to that service member because, you know, when you're coming and going and, and off doing dangerous things or even just, you know, it's it's dangerous just what soldiers do day to day when they're training. You know, Even at the base. There. Yeah, you're out there in Texas. You know, we were stationed at Fort Hood a couple of times. Yeah, huge, well, yeah, Army huge, Army. huge, yeah. Um. Every unit we were ever in, I have to say, there were accidents, there were deaths, helicopter crashes, and this is above and beyond combat. You know, so things happen all the time. And that service member needs to know, like you said, there is a mom or a dad waiting for him, a wife at the end of the day. And I took that role job very seriously. When I became an army wife, it was kind of like, you know what? I'm in this to support my husband. 
then when we had kids, I I took that role seriously. I'm I'm here to to raise those two boys because my husband came and went. Oftentimes I was a single parent. And I took that job very seriously because I felt like if if not me, then who? You know, it's like I'm gonna raise these kids and and so I have to say it's very rewarding at the end of all that for them to say, hey, we want to do the same thing as dad. Um, and, you know, they signed up for duty and and they're living the life now and and they're living the dream. I mean, you know, what's not to like about, well, uh, you know, you, you have, you, I think I think you have to realize also that if 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 they if they grew up and felt they wanted to be aviators as well, it's because you made you ensured that the life that you had with your husband, they didn't see as something detrimental to relationships that, hey, right. I can like this and at the same time have a family look. My mom did it, right? Yeah, and and you know, it wasn't always easy. I mean, and and I write about that. I'm very honest and open in my writings and in my books and the stories I tell. It's not just all the the parades and the pomp and circumstance and and my husband, you know, rising up in rank. It was never about that. Um, but the the joys and the pride and the extraordinary people that we met, the places we lived, all of that offset the fears, the stress, the challenging times. Um, and we had to work at it every step of the way. We we just celebrated 47 years of marriage. And, um, you know, there were times when it was like I was so worn out, I couldn't face another deployment or separation or another move, but we did it. We did it because we loved each other. And we were in it for the long haul. And you know what? Now life is like so sweet. <laughs> you know, we have the time, we have the means to to travel and be with our sons and their families. And and now we watch it all, you know, through their eyes. And, and sometimes it's kind of funny. You know, my husband will say, Vicki, I can't believe these kids have to go off again. And I look at him and I say, but that's what he did. <laughs> he sees it so different now that he's right. retired. He's the father of these kids doing it. And he'll say, boy, the, the op tempo, the pace is so hectic. And I said, Dick, I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, let me ask you a, 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 a rather intense question here. And that is, um, you were, uh, you were uh, pretty much, in the position of having your husband starting out as a lieutenant and general to be in a in a fairly good i mean not 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 to discount it anyway but in a in a very good position now there are a lot of enlisted folks that oh, have yeah. to go through the same uh the <laughs> same issues maybe with not that much support what do you have to tell them and what do you have to tell the system to uh, maybe take better care of our enlisted and lower ranked, uh, lower ranked uh, officers. Well, and, and you know, we've come such a long way um, because now like our oldest son is actually a, a brigade commander right now. He's commanding an aviation um, brigade. Um, I look at what's going on now. The army did grow and evolve with, and, and certainly uh, when the war in Iraq started, and I mean, that dragged on for like, you know, about two decades, mm -hmm. the army really did have to step up. And, and during those earlier years, that's when my husband was the vice chief and, and he and I traveled to the various posts and, and met with families and soldiers and, and tried to see what the needs were. And those, you know, from the old days, it was called family support groups back mm -hmm. in my day. OK, those have evolved. They do include the enlisted, the NCO spouses. Um, so I, I think that the Army has done a better job to embrace all family members and not just officers, wives. It's no longer those little coffee groups for social reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and, and actually my second book, Fly Safe, that's that's all about the Gulf War. I talk then, and that was back in 1990, 1991. That was when we first realized that the little coffee groups of the past were going to have to go by the wayside because that war involved pretty much, you know, the entire army, National Guard reserves. That was when we first started to regroup and think of those those spouse groups as more. Um, well, now we call them family readiness groups. Um, 
they had to encompass a lot more than just social activities. But at the very basis of these support groups, readiness groups, whatever you want to call them, um, what it does is it gives people a connection to their service member. It keeps them connected with other people that are going through exactly what they're going through. Um, and it keeps you busy. It gave us things to do. And I'm so glad that those have continued and they encompass more people. Um, and so really there are groups out there. It's, but you know, the spouse or the family member has to want to join it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you can only lead people so far and you do get complaints from people and they'll say, well, I, I didn't have anybody to talk to or whatever. Well, it, it it's there. And even the National Guard and reserve units, they have their own support system because, you know, that's a whole other challenge. They're coming from towns and cities in America. Um, so they're not on an army post, mm -hmm. but it. The resources are there, and I think that the Army is, of course, there's always room to grow, but I think they've come a long way. Well, good. I mean, as, as long as I'm always into improvement, both in health, yeah. making sure that these people who have all, all fought for us, your husband, your kids inclusive, that everybody is uh, well taken care of. The type of politics that I'm into, I want to make sure that those folks who go defend us all are well taken care of, health care retirement, yes. yep. and everything to make sure they can live that life that they deserve. Anyway, um, in closing, Vicki, why don't you tell me something that uh, you had wanted to talk about that I probably didn't ask you that you want folks who uh, are, are candidates to try your books, Fly Safe and Army Wife. Why don't you tell us a little something about uh, what I should have asked? Okay, so I always tell readers my books aren't just for military spouses or military, you know, people. I I love it when civilians read my books and get back to me and say, wow, I never knew this or that. I never knew that's how you live. I didn't know what that was like to have, you know, a loved one deployed. Um, and people usually come away from reading my books with a new appreciation for our military. Um, and certainly, you know, learning a little bit more and my, and my books are, you know, I keep the history, um, alive in these books, you know, because I, my husband and I were living it, you know, and the second book fly safe, that's based on the letters that my husband wrote me and my journal entries. Um, so people get a very realistic glimpse behind the scenes what it's like in the combat zone but what it's like back home so i would just say i i believe my books appeal to all readers not just military um and i talk about a, a lot of just life's um challenges and and universal you know things and and just you know my growth as as a wife a mother um and as a woman so I, I would like to think that that people will take a look at my books just for those reasons and not just because it's some dry, you know, look at army life. Vicki Cody, author of Army Wife and Fly Safe. Thank you so kindly for having been with Politics Done Right. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of our show again we have a great guest to to bring you today you know what we talk about a whole lot speaking to all sides being able to communicate very well on all sides well this is the man isaac saul is the founder and editor of tangle an independent ad-free nonpartisan newsletter that has been recognized by the new york times forbes and substack as one of the most successful political newsletters tangle has over thirty thousand daily readers and presents a left-right breakdown of the biggest political news stories of the day. You gotta check it out with the goal of representing the best arguments from both sides of the aisle. Welcome to Politics Done Right. Isaac, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, look, first of all, tell me a little bit about yourself. How did you get started, et cetera? Sure, yes. Uh, I'm a political journalist. And, uh, you know, I came to this work by 
publishing my writing, my opinions, my investigative journalism, my straight news reports in a wide variance of news outlets. And over time, realizing that people essentially trusted or listened to what I was writing based solely on the outlet that it was being published in. So, you know, I could write the same piece in Fox News and Huffington Post. And if it was in Fox News, no liberal would read it or care about it or trust it. And if it was in the Huffington Post, no conservative would read about it or care about it or trust it. And I decided that I wanted to try and bridge the gap a little bit. And, you know, I think there's a lot of problems with the current media ecosystem. And one of them is that we're not honest about our biases as journalists. Uh, another one of them is that, you know, depending on what news outlet you read, you're almost certainly going to get basically just one side of the story. And so I came up with this concept to just put what the right is saying, put what the left is saying right next to each other, let you read both of those things, come to your own conclusions, add a little bit of my own commentary, some basic facts about the story too, and then kind of take it from there. I love, I, I, I simply love that because I hate to say that's what I do. You know I mean? We, 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 <laughs> I, I, I'm a, I'm a lefty, but the truth of the matter is a lot of my audience are people on the right because of the honesty with which I accept what I believe in and I accept what they, they accept that they believe what they believe. And I think that's important. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I kind of have a hunch where you, your persuasion is. I'm not quite sure, especially after write, writing that particular Huffington Post article about Hillary Clinton. I thought it was, <laughs> you know, I was going to hit that one. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I, I, but I mean, it was honest. And, and that is what I think people, people like. I think people probably enjoy that. Uh, it's, it's not about what you say. It's about whether what you're saying is fact-based or whether you're honest with the belief that you have your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, what I like to say is that, uh, you know, I'm politically incongruent. I don't fit into one box, you know? I mean, the story you're referencing is a piece I wrote, uh, I guess, seven, six or seven years ago now, in 2016 leading up to the election where I basically you know apologized for some really critical writing I had written about Hillary Clinton I I sort of excoriated her and then gone back and said you know what maybe there's more merit to her candidacy than I had thought but you know over time my politics have evolved on a lot of issues especially as I've grown up and seen more of the world and uh, I think what what I what I typically say to people is you know, it just depends on the issue. Sometimes people subscribe to Tangle on a Monday and they reply to the newsletter that day and they say, you said you were nonpartisan, but, you know, I can tell you're a liberal from your take in today's newsletter. And then the people who sign up on Tuesday will say, hey, you say you're nonpartisan, but I can tell you're a secret conservative based on your take in today's newsletter. And it's because, you know, it just depends on the issue. And I think a lot of Americans are like that. I think a lot of people don't fit neatly into one political box and i'm trying to say you know that's okay it's all right to it's all right to dunk on your team every now and then it's all right to change your point of view on something if you see a good argument for it and it's okay to say you know i'm not a democrat or a republican and i think that that's becoming more and more popular today i mean independents are now the largest self-identified political group in america and it's for good reason because uh you know the the two major parties are both deeply flawed right now yeah, they're absolutely and deeply thought. Now, interestingly, you said something about um, the, you know, not being a partisan. I, I don't, I don't consider myself a partisan. I consider myself, however, believing in a particular ideology. And I think what's interesting is most of the people in this country believe they believe in my ideology, and I would, I would, I would proffer your ideology as well, which is whatever is good for the vast majority of people, whatever, whatever the policies are. And, you know, most of the times those policies appear in one section, but every so often it appears somewhere else as well. And you have to be brave enough to to point that out. And I think in your writings, that is your later writings, that is something that you've proved your thoughts on that. Look, I mean, I think, uh, you know, progressives are called progressives for a reason and conservatives are called conservatives for a reason. I mean, one side is trying to change the country and reform it in a lot of ways. And the other side is trying to prevent change and hold on to certain things from the past. And I think there are great things about our country and our country's founding and, and the status quo. And there are really bad things about it too. And, and that to me is sort of 
what both sides kind of bring to the table and offer in a really helpful and valuable way. Um, you know, I think what, one of my positions right now that is sort of evolving or I'm reflecting on a bit more is that I have for a long time been a huge critic of our military defense budget and how big it is and how bloated it is and how much money we spend on guns and tanks and airplanes and bases in other countries when our schools are falling apart and all these things. And then, you know, I watched Ukraine get invaded by an authoritarian leader this, this month. And I have to admit, it, I, it occurred to me, I'm really, really glad that I know this would never happen in the United States because we're the biggest and the baddest and nobody's going to come for us. And it was the first time in my life I've ever really second guessed that political view of mine. And I'm trying to reflect on it with an open mind right now. And I think, you know, more Americans should be open to that and open to changing their opinions and thinking about it because, you know, I, I think the vast majority of people are well-intentioned. And while most politicians are very interested in preserving their power, there are a number of really decent, good politicians on both sides of the aisle who are trying to do what they think is, is good for the country. Now, you opened a door that I, I, I would like for you to maybe write some, some about, and I'd, be, I'd love to get that newsletter myself and, and post it. But you made an interesting point that uh, Ukraine really sort of make you, made you rethink your 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 process your thought process on big military and you know i i you know there's for me that's neither here and there other than uh sh should we look at it from the point of view like okay i'm glad that there's still a big military as opposed to why can't we do both or even that uh maybe some is overkill your thoughts yeah i mean i think you know i i guess first of all it's something i'm still processing a little bit and so i'll i'll caveat everything i'm about to say with that but you know, I think it's just that I'm I'm realizing that our safety and our security as a country is something that I often take for granted and that a lot of countries across the planet don't live with that safety and don't live with that security. And the reason that we have that safety and that security is because we have the biggest and the most well-funded military in the world. And most countries recognize that it would be a suicide mission to to invade us or to, you know, really mess with us even on the world stage. Now, of course, that doesn't change my view that a lot of the, the military explorations that we've taken from Iraq to Afghanistan to funding Saudi arms, all these things, I still view very negatively. I mean, I don't think we should be spending our military money on projects in other nations, quote unquote, you know, spreading democracy with bombs. But I do, I think for the first time, really recognize why so many people, why so many conservatives in particular support such a huge military budget, which is that they recognize that there are a lot of threats out there in the world and it's better to be safe than sorry. And, um, you know, just watching the events of the last few weeks have, have made me reflect on that a little bit. You know, um, today I got a message from, uh, from a good friend that we participate in several um, uh, organizations, nonpartisan org organizations, that is, and one of the questions that she asked, and um, this, is, this isn't any kind of a, 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 a gotcha or anything, but I, I would love to hear your opinion on that because I gave an opinion. I'm, I'm pulling it up as we speak, if it'll decide to come up someday, somehow, sometime. But I'll, I'll caveat the question and say it this way. She said, is journalism, uh, should, is, has, it says, should journalistic objectivity be standard reporting your thoughts on should i'm going to give you my answer after but i'm curious to see how you would interpret that question yeah it's a it's a huge question our industry is facing right now and my answer is that no journalist is truly objective there are fair journalists and there are hacks and i think it's really important to separate the two i think it's important to separate the reporters out there who clearly have a political agenda, who are willing to obscure the facts or spread misinformation in order to tell the story they want to tell. But I know a lot of liberal and a lot of conservative journalists, people who openly wear their politics on their sleeves, who are also really great fair reporters that will go out and cover a story and do it fairly. And I think there's a lot of honor in the work that journalists do when it's done right. And the best reporters feel a great deal of responsibility to try and tell a story that's true and honest and 
holistic. And so, you know, it's not always easy to decipher, but uh, one of the things I like to remind people is, look, even the most liberal journalists in the world are often the ones who are most critical of their team, of the Democratic Party. I mean, they're the ones who write the hardest hitting stories about the president who is a Democrat because they expect the highest of that president. Um, the, the famous example, in my opinion, is you know the New York Times, widely seen as a left-wing newspaper now, is the paper that broke the story on Hillary Clinton's emails. They're the paper that has covered Obama's drone wars in the Middle East. You know, Two of the biggest stains on two of the biggest Democrats in the country came from the New York Times, which is supposed to be a paper that is, you know, a left-wing paper. And um, you just never know how it's going to play out. You know, I, 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 first of all, I agree with absolutely everything that you said. I want to read two short paragraphs that I told her, and I want you to comment on that if, and, and, and expand on it, actually. I said, should journalistic objectivity, uh, standard reporting, yes, but journalistic objectivity has never existed to be begin with Journalists and or their producers choose the stories they cover and the stories they cover, even if they are simply reporting occurrences without opinion, illustrate subjectivity. As an example, figure out all the violent crime in any given city, then watch the local news. Do the protagonists of said violent crime on the six o'clock news reflect either the totality or proportionality of those in reality? I don't think it does. Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, well, story selection bias is one of the biggest and most important kinds of bias that exists in the news. Obviously, you know, the easiest way to illustrate this is go to HuffingtonPost.com on one morning and then go to FoxNews.com on the same day. And the front pages of those two websites will be radically different, despite the fact they're trying to cover the exact same thing, you know, U.S. national politics and, and global political world. Um, they choose stories based on how they want their audience to feel on that day or what they want their audience to click on. So obviously, you know, a Fox News knows that if they cover a story about 50 migrants trying to cross the southern border, that's going to get a lot more clicks than the Huffington Post would get if they covered that exact same story. Um, you know, related to the crime numbers, it's an interesting point. I think, uh, you know, it's it's another reminder that even something that's supposed to be as straightforward as data can be really obscured. I mean, the the violent crime rise across the United States right now, I think, is a really complex thing. And I see a lot of people trying to sign it to, oh, the police are pulling back because of the defund the police movement. And it's like, yeah, I mean, maybe there's something there. Maybe that's something to do with it. But, you know, we also just went through a global pandemic where millions of people lost their jobs and anxiety was really high and people are using drugs more. And, you know, these are all things that contribute to crime rates. And so, um, you know, it's it's very rarely the black and white answer. I, I like to tell people, you know, look for the gray and you'll find some clarity, actually, believe it or not. And, you know, piggy, piggybacking on that, I, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? I mean, it's, it's complex. It's a bit more complex, but most of our reporters, including the, the, the regular mainstream media, and that's why a newsletter like yours is so important because you go, go through and the machinations of both sides, or I shouldn't say both sides, it's really the machinations of all sides to actually try to discern where it's not commonality, but where the actual math exists. I always tell people BS in, BS out. If the FBI data looks like crap when it goes in because of who actually gets the numbers in there, the numbers that get out is going to be crap as well. Now, we take a look at something like Ukraine right now. Ukraine, it has the real sympathetic ear of the United States right now. And we really feel for those people who look like most Americans right now. And we cannot believe that those things are happening in Ukraine. And uh, I mean, worse, worse atrocities continue today to occur throughout the world that we don't see. Remember talking earlier about selectivity of stories, et cetera, what actually get covered. And um, we, 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 don't, we don't see that. So we take a look and say, a lot of people immediately blame Americans and say, look at how Americans are. This, this white country in, in Europe gets nailed for who they care. When in, in, if we take a look at the totality, our media does not humanize elsewhere like they humanized Ukraine. You can't blame the average American populace for the impressions that they get from the fourth estate. 
And that's why I talk about the importance of what you do, the importance of what I do, because again, it's not easy to just go blame Americans for that's how they are, how Americans are. No, Americans are reflecting what the fourth estate presents to them. Your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think it's a really great point. I mean, I actually just wrote a bit of a Twitter thread about this recently, which was, you know, the response that I saw, I think, was similar to the response you saw when there was this outpouring of love and support for Ukraine. There was a lot of people who were sort of shaming people who felt for Ukraine saying, oh, where were you when, you know, bombs were being dropped on Yemen or in Iraq or Syria? And my message was, you know, this is an opening here. We have an opportunity where we're getting a clear view that when people are exposed to these kinds of horrors, it's really moving them. And instead of seeing that as an opportunity to shame somebody for feeling horrible about what's happening in Ukraine, use it as an opportunity, as an opening to realize that the more people who see these kinds of things happening across the world, the more humanity and empathy there will be for yes. them. And the greater our chances are of actually stopping war and stopping these things from happening in the future. And so don't spend your time shaming people. Spend your time saying, yes, you're right. This is terrible. We should always reject it when you know a country is dropping bombs on millions of innocent people and then hold everybody to that standard across the board in Yemen and Syria and Iraq. And that's how you sort of facilitate the change rather than, you know, making people feel horrible for, for having a feeling they should have, which is you should be horrified by what's happening in Ukraine. It's a terrible, horrible thing. Exactly right. You know, um, uh, I tell you what, doing what I do, I imagine doing what you do as well. Uh, you get to meet people of all stripes. And what I've really found out when I, you know, I tell people all the time, most people are good, right? And uh, I tell people that all the time and everybody, you know, my, my audience is mixed. I mean, I'm very, very, I have liberals, progressives, uh, black, white, everything, big audience, right? That, that, that type of audience. And what I try to tell them as we talk together is that if we stop looking at each other as somehow what forces and believe me, there are forces that need us to look at each other differently to keep the system alive. You need those forces. I said, if we start, I always talk about loving your brother on my show, my program, you know, if, if we just start thinking that kind of a way, you know what I mean? You'd start to see a whole lot of things change because my, when, when my right wingers come on and they, they name call me on my show, I look at them and say, hey, cool, brother, still love you, man. And understand that a lot of these things are externalities a lot of these things come from abroad and start looking at people's humanity proper a lot of these problems are solved yeah no i think it's a great point i mean i uh one of the things i really like to do when people ask me about you know how do you talk about politics with people who you disagree with um, I get a lot of emails from, you know, readers who have an aunt or an uncle or they have kids who are really politically opposite of them or friends even. And they just say, you know, I don't even know how to broach the conversation. And I'm like, this is such a golden opportunity. Most of us spend, you know, so much of our time arguing with people online and all this stuff, you know. You have a neighbor who has a big Trump flag out front. You don't know what his deal is or you're scared of him or whatever. Go buy a six pack of beer and walk over there and knock on his door and tell him you want to chat, you know, and yes. that that is how yes. you actually bridge the gap and change things. And in my personal life, it's it's worked wonders. You know, I'll talk to anybody. I'll chat with anybody. I interview anybody um, because when you talk to people and you break down that stuff, you actually, you know, can ma make some progress out there in the world a little bit. We're almost coming to the end. I, I, I had a, 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 I used to go not all the time, but I actually got invited to a couple of uh, tea. You remember the tea party days? Yeah. I was going to yeah. honky tonky bars, drinking the tea party, <laughs> and, you know, ha hanging out with these guys and talking, you know, uh, not, 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 a, not, not a problem, right? So, I mean, um, that beer thing works like a champ. I had a woman called me up, one of my, um, one of my listeners, and she said, Egberto, she lived in my part of town, and she said, Egberto, can we go out to coffee? I really need to talk to you about my family. I said, sure, let's go. So I went and had coffee with her, and what it was, it was Thanksgiving time, and she was going home with her family, and her family is racist. Her family or big Trump supporters and all of that. And she said, I, I don't want to go. I don't think I should go. What you think or whatever. I told her, you need to go 
And you know what? The first time they just said something, just say, I love you, man. We may disagree. Love you, man. You know? And she left there with a big smile on her face because I think one of the things is that she's so enlightened. She thought that it was almost doing something wrong by going to hang with her family who she knows was a racist bunch. And I'm like, no, it's your family. You know, just go out there and you keep trying, you know, just go out there. It does, it, it works. And in the long run, they will see what comes out of you and they'll change. Yeah. And, and to that point too, I should add, you know, there are a lot of conservatives out there who are scared to speak their mind because they feel like they're going to be hated by people on the left. And, and, you know, if you're a liberal and it sounds like maybe a lot of your audience is progressive, I mean, being able to hear somebody who is on the right espouse their political views and not immediately demonize them is a good way to earn their trust and make them mere you know, make them feel more comfortable and more vulnerable and more willing to talk out their side of things too. Because just like there are a lot of people like that who are scared to go home to their, you know, Trump family or their racist family or whatever, there are a lot of conservatives out there who are scared to speak openly about their views because they're worried about getting canceled or screamed at or labeled a racist mm -hmm. or a bigot or whatever. And, uh, you know, we're just, we're really not talking to each other enough right now. It's a big that problem. That is so true. Well, let me ask you, Isaac, last question is, um, and I asked this one to everybody on my show at the end, what would you have liked me to ask you that I didn't? Oh, man, that's a great question. Uh, I would have liked you to ask me um, something about my political views changing, I think. That's always a good question. Well, you know, have at it. <laughs> well, I, I guess uh, to that point, you know, what I like to say when people ask about, you know, you well, one of the questions I get from a lot of people is you write this newsletter, you always talk about changing your political views, you know, where have your views actually changed today, I guess I had a little bit of an example that I'm going through this thing with the the military funding, but um, one of the one of the political views that I've had really change, not I guess my political view hasn't changed, but I've become a lot less radicalized about it, is the issue of abortion, which I am a pretty still vehemently pro-choice. But in my experience writing this newsletter, I have interacted with a ton of readers who are anti-abortion, pro-life conservatives, and talking to them, emailing with them, writing with them, even having a phone call with a few I've realized that kind of the caricature that I've been fed of most pro-life Americans is actually just that. It's sort of like a really extremist version of these kind of really hateful, oftentimes super religious, very, very, very conservative Americans. And what I've found is that a lot of these people are just like really decent people. They, they don't want to control women's bodies. They just fundamentally want to you know, keep life. And, and, I, and it's a much more relatable position from talking to them about it. And I've sort of come to realize that, um, you know, not every pro-choice or not every pro-life person out there is just like a raving religious zealot. A lot of them are actually not religious. A lot of them are Democrats. A lot of them are politically moderate. They just have this issue that they really care about, whether it's because of religion, whether it's a scientific thing that, you know, once they hear a heartbeat, they feel that means we should preserve the life. Um, and, and I just really come to kind of respect a lot of their I guess, motivations for that political view, even though I still disagree with them. And I think there's a lot of other reasons to disagree with them aside from just the really religious conservative stuff. But um, I've learned to have really productive conversations about it, which I never thought I'd be able to do since I think it's one of the hardest topics in the country right now. Prescient, prescient. I tell you, um, if I had more time, I would like, I would have told you about my Medicare for all story and a, a, conservative, <laughs> a, a conservative woman ultimately coming up with that solution herself. And when realizing that she came up with the same solution that I did, who at that point she didn't know I was progressive said, but you're so nice. And the reason I'm saying that is you use the word caricature. Her belief of what a liberal or progressive looked like was a caricature. And like you just said there, once you start to talk to people, it's no longer about being a caricature, like you said, it's about just the humanity in all of us. Isaac, 
uh, Paul, I looked at I, when I saw your name, I said two <laughs> names out of the New Testament. Yeah, I said, <laughs> Or maybe, maybe maybe the other thing as well. Maybe maybe the uh, the the what is it called again? Um, well, you know what I'm talking about. The Torah. The Torah. That's what that's. I was trying. That's I was right. trying to get it. I I'm said, a good Jew, baby. <laughs> hey, but you know, it, it is funny. It is funny because that's the first that after I said that, I'm said no. Maybe I should say the Torah, right? And then, <laughs> hey, we we're we're people, man. We're people. Anyhow. Isaac Paul, it's been my pleasure to have you. Are a great interviewee, man. I, I, I love your politics or non-politics, whatever the hell it is. And uh, you know, continue doing what you do with your newsletter. I think we need a whole lot more people out there that are presenting our politics the way you present our politics. Thank you so kindly for having been on Politics and Right. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And if people want to check it out, go to readtangle.com and you can find the newsletter and, and soak it all in. All of it's going to be in the bottom of the blog, folks. Check it out. Thank you so kindly. Take Thank care, you, Isaac. Have a good one. All right, let's go ahead and get Daniel in. Daniel, come on in, sir. Hello, how are you, Alberto? Great, folks. Let me just uh, let me introduce you. Daniel is the uh, president of uh, Indivisible Houston, and he covers a lot of the local elections and much more. Daniel, give me your breakdown, your thoughts. Let's start with Harris County. What are your thoughts on Harris County? I think Harris County has. So, look, the Republican Party put together. Uh, you know, they, they came very, very hard uh, for different seats. And I'm going to give you, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit of some of the areas where they actually broke through to start. Remember, there, there are five judicial seats where it seems like they're going to break through. Right. Uh, you know, and, and so there is that some of those efforts worked. Um, but they're, where they tried hardest of all of their different efforts was at the county judge level. Right. Um, Alex Miller spent millions upon millions of dollars that was handed to her by everyone from local developers, uh, you know, like Weekly Homes, five million bucks put into her back pocket, huge money spent by dark money packs that have popped up overnight, and West Texas uh, uh, billionaires who believe in a dominionist version of Christianity that is essentially a, a fascist ideology, and they all tucked money into her pocket. Um, you know, not to mention everyone from, from Ted Cruz to all the local Republicans and everybody else putting their thumb on the scale, and they still couldn't do it. I'm not sure Ted Cruz helped her out, as we all saw the, you know, for, at the Astros parade. He's not the most popular guy in town. Um, <laughs> that can't but, fly but one way or another, I, I mean, I mean the, the, at the end of the day, that was not enough. And the Hidalgo campaign was uh, successful because of a lot of the, the hard work that has been put in here in Harris County over the years and because of all the hard work that has, been, that has gone into uh, this cycle. i got to give a, a shout-out to a couple of people on that. Um, Diana, if, if you're listening, uh, you know, she, you, you're, you're a hero. Um, Very much so. Races the last, last couple of years and, or last couple of cycle, cycles, and you kept up the fight, and it's the people down at the Cornyn protest and the people who have been block walking uh, and, and cl the clubs in action pack and groups like that uh, that it did a lot, of, a lot of the hard work that built up that firewall to make sure those, that, that 15,000 vote margin showed up today. So I, I, I want to stop you right there, there well Daniel. I want to uh -huh. stop you right there for one specific reason, because I, that, that call out that you made is so important because we have to keep those people who are supporting candidates that support the people engage and you're correct diana wrote a hell of a piece in fact i carried it and interviewed her for for the piece as well and uh, many others working I, I, I we did something with the uh, clubs in action just last week that we posted and made sure a whole lot of people saw that there were i mean uh, i want all these politicians to know the ones who got elected right uh, to remember i want them to remember how they got there and, and, and to serve the people. These activists are the ones who did it. They are the ones who engage people. In other words, activism and, floor, activism and groundwork will beat bill, millions of dollars any day. And the work that you do and many others in this county and throughout this country do are the ones who win elections for you. Continue, please. I just wanted to reiterate that, Daniel. Oh no! I, th I, pre I I think you're absolutely right. I think you're looking at 
look, for the first time in history, you're looking at a 4-1 commissioner's court. I think there, it, was, it was a major discussion, discussion point this cycle, and it has been recently, about underrepresentation of the Latino community in Harris County. And now you look at commissioner's court, it's three out of five members of the court right. um, are, you know, are, are, are Latino. So it's, it's, um, I think that this has been a, a seismic shift uh, since 2018 in what the and, and really since 2016 in many respects and even a little bit before that. Right. Let's say over the last decade or so, uh, we've seen a seismic shift in what's going on in Harris County. Uh, we've seen massive movement on the ground, and it's going to have to continue um, because one. These folks are not going to just, you know, take their money and go home. They're going to keep trying to buy our county. Exactly. And two, um, a four-one Democratic commissioner's court doesn't mean that it's a lock for all the policies that you want. You got to advocate, right? I want to talk to you about that because um, that is something that that has to be watched. In other words, a lot of people think, oh, all the folks that um, we got into power now, we know that the people that we serve, which is all the people, that it, they're going to do what needs to be done. Of course, we know better. Tell us a little bit about that. What what do we have to watch out for? Well, so Judge Hidalgo has passed a, a truly um, revolutionary progressive agenda in a positive way over the last few years. We now have universal pre-K in Harris County uh, and full-throated support for um, for the Harris County Department of Education, we've seen improvements on the long, along the lines of, of health services that have been offered, and we've seen, um, you know, she, 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 she had to, to, beat, to fend off this extreme position and, and just, just outright lying propaganda campaign from the, uh, you know, for, from, from the bail bond industry and, um, hard, you know, re- Republicans who are trying to buy our seat. You know, just a very cynical campaign that was chock full of lies that were so brilliantly dispelled on some of your recent show, shows regarding bail reform. That, that bail reform, you know, the bail reform, the county bail reform, misdemeanor bail reform that was implemented was nothing short of, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, it was, it was, it was a pot, it was a huge, huge change that gave so many people their rights back. And um, the bail bond industry didn't like it and ran a campaign based on lies surrounding it for this entire cycle. So that they could pad their pockets. So that, and, and there's so many other things we could talk to, talk about. But what I'm getting at is, these changes wouldn't have happened if we hadn't seen the court change in 2018. And these changes are not guaranteed in the next court because when you have a four-one majority, um, it changes the dynamics. You no longer have a, a thin majority of three people who have to stick together. You have some ideological discrepancies within the majority on the court. So. We might even argue that you need people even more so now to call the commissioners, to call the county judge, to show up to commissioner's court, to advocate, write editorials, drop letters to the editor, to protest, to do whatever it is, and whatever it is that it takes to make sure that we see um, the fruits of all of the labor of activists, that we continue to see the expansion of health care programs in Harris County, that we continue to see reform so that we don't have an, a jail that is a, an eyesore, a black eye on us, a moral black eye on us as a county that's, that's nationally and sometimes even internationally pointed to as an enormous problem. Um, you know, that, that's, that's going to take advocacy because if we don't advocate, people will settle back into their roles and vendors will begin to knock at the door again. The judge has turned down vendor money, that's for sure. But what about the rest of the commissioners? I mean, there, there's, there's a lot more work that needs to be done to make sure to hold these people accountable to what they said on their website, but also to move them from the positions that they have that are not aligned with the people who did all that work to make sure that they got into office. So, yeah, in a lot of ways, I mean, the, the work, I won't say the work starts now because it started before, but it sure needs to continue. I am glad you said that the work starts now. The, you know, it's an important thing that you just said there. We have to hold all of them accountable because uh, when, you know, you, folks might look and say, oh, we have a 4-1 court that somehow is more progressive and will do more progressive things. At the same time, we have to watch absolutely all of them to ensure that that is exactly what what happens and knowing that the activists who put them well the activists that who actually got them there will continue to be have watchful eyes are important and i think what you're saying there is so i mean what what you said there with respect to we don't know that they're going to follow what they claim they're going to follow on their websites etc is extremely uh important daniel now let's go ahead and uh, expand a little bit further now let's go to the state we're talking to the county level now let's look at the state 
talk to me about uh, what was Beto's problem, what was Collier's problem, what was Garcia's problem? Uh, well, you know, well, look, let me let me just preface this by saying we need some time here, you know, to really figure out what ha- what happened and what because even if we had all the data in front of us immediately, yes. we'd still need to take the time to read it, and then you need time to think on it and meditate and digest, and you got to look at that in context of anything that happens over the next few months because the story can change, right? right. What people feel, felt yesterday might be different in a month or two, so we so I just want to preface it with that because I see a lot of pundits out there that. I think I think there's a whole cottage industry dedicated to folks who are they have to speak more confidently than they actually have any right to be. And right. I don't want to fall into that. So the morning after election, I always try to temper that a little bit. But what I will say is a couple of things that I think I think these are clear. Mm-hmm. One is people should regard. Look, maybe maybe your ideology is a little different than Beto, whatever it is. But if you wanted to see pushback against a far right extremist election denying anti democratic republican push in the state of texas then you owe beto a thank you right. because he barnstormed all the valley he barnstormed the cities and he definitely added to the margins in in large counties and he definitely added to the margins in the valley where there were three seats that were up for grabs I mean, I, I've you know I've talked to you before about it. I'm not shy about it. I don't really think very much of Henry Cuellar, right. but nevertheless, if you want to, if 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 you had any interest in how some of these races turned out, you owe it a little bit. I mean, you got to owe the credit. You got to give it to Beto O'Rourke that he went down there and did that. He fought an uphill fight. We're a state that we've uh, we've we've very commonly said that Texas is a non-voting state, not a red state. I do think that we need to to calibrate our our statement on that a little bit to be a little bit more nuanced because it seems to give people the impression that if we just brought people out that we would flip it, but every vote is a persuasion vote. Exactly. Um, you know, my friend Nish, my friend Nisha says that we need to be persuading people all the time. We shouldn't assume how people vote one way or another. But we should give them the benefit of the doubt that if we get to have a conversation about their values, about what they think, about what the truth is, that we'll be able to persuade them. But we have to persuade them. We have to have that conversation, let, let me, and we have to inform them. Let me tell you, Daniel, I respect everything that uh, Beto O'Rourke did, and I am not one of those that are going to be there, hidden Beto or hidden uh, hidden Collier or hidden Garcia. or any. I am very happy that these guys went out there and opened up 254 counties in Texas. They may not have been successful in winning themselves, but they sure as hell opened the door for a lot. I spoke to some folks in, in Cleveland and other places where, I mean, Cleveland, Texas, where uh, they, 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 his, his, just him going out there and making folks know I am there. Now, there are other things that need to be done, and it's not for, for Beto to do it, or but it's for the grassroots to do it. All those rural areas that won't get their hospitals back because uh, Greg Abbott is not going to sign on to the Medicaid expansion to the Affordable Care Act. Act, they needed. We needed to have a, a a grassroots culture in those areas, letting folks know that your hospital closed because they refused to accept the money. We needed to do that grassroots work, and and it's a learning experience, and we'll do it. And on on the internet, I want to welcome Dilbert Doe and Hijack Sarafani, as well as Bronx, New York, Nolan Dearborn, Sophia Williams, Joan Mara. Thank you for watching us here on on the internet. But Daniel, um, give me a closer. I need to go to Baba Chakwe. Yeah, sure. I mean, everybody keep up the fight. If you don't know how, you can always reach out to Indivisible Houston. That's Indivisible, like One Nation, Indivisible Houston, like this wonderful city that we live in, dot org, IndivisibleHouston.org. And let's get in touch. Um, remember to keep pushing. Remember to keep fighting for sure. Uh, and, and, you know, changes here. We talked about it after 2020. We're not, the, these fascists are not going to take the country. They're not taking the county. Um, but we've got to materialize that. We've got to make that happen. Um, but I'll be, you know, I'm going to be danged if that's going to happen. And I think there are a lot of people out there who believe that, too. And if you're one of those people, I mean, it, it doesn't matter how long you've been engaged in politics or if you know what it's like or what's going on in it, there is something that you can do. So I would just say everybody keep pushing, but continue to. And if you haven't been engaged before, there's still room for you. Welcome to democracy. I appreciate you. And thanks for being a member of the Free and Independent Press, Egberto. Thank you so kindly, Daniel. And you keep up the great work. You're respected out here, brother. All right. We 
spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.